to Isaiah chapter 6. Remember, we mentioned that it's going to be a challenge for us to go through the entire Isaiah in one year. So by reason of that, we have selected some of the passages that we're supposed to have some kind of idea that will cover some sections so that we are able to touch the entire Isaiah within a given day. Isaiah chapter 6. We'll read the whole 13 verses. But before that, let us pray. We thank you, Lord, for this time that you have given to us. We have been encouraged through the songs and the many things that we have done. And at this point, as we study your words together, we ask that you grant us understanding. Speak to our hearts, Lord, and bless our hearts with your word, and help us to be obedient to your word. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Isaiah chapter 6, from verse 1, and I'm reading from the New NIV. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were a seraphim, each with six wings, with two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorpost and threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with thumbs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. He said, Go and tell these people, Be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the hearts of the people callous. Make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. Then I said, For how long, Lord? And he answered, Until the cities lie ruined and without inhabitants, until the houses are left deserted, and the fields ruined and ravaged, until the Lord has sent everyone far away, and the land is utterly forsaken. And though a tent remains in the land, it will again be laid waste, but as the turbines and oak leave stumps when they are cut down, so the holy seed will be stormed in the land. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Today we are looking at the topic, Beholding the Holiness of God, as we have it in the bulletin, or Gazing into the Holiness of God. Isaiah paints the year he had this vision, in the year that King Uzziah died. Now, Uzziah reigned for about 52 years, probably one of the longest serving kings in Judah. History has it 
that he was among the godly kings that ruled over Judah. He was also called Azariah. So in places, uh, if you compare uh, 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 21, and 2 Chronicles chapter 26, verse 1, you would see the same account captured but different names used. So Azariah was probably his own given name, and Uziah became uh, a name that is associated with his throne. Now, Uziah's downfall came at a certain point in the history of the nation. As I said earlier, he was godly and one of the longest serving kings in the history of Judah. The nation actually saw prosperity during the time of King Uziah. He was a very strong king and gave good leadership. But something happened along the way. He insisted on offering the sacrifice by burning incense in the temple. Now, that duty is reserved only for the high priest. But Uzziah decided he was going to offer uh, that kind of offering. And I don't want to go into the detail, but just to mention that, by reason of that singular act, God was angry with him, and God struck him down with leprosy immediately. And by reason of this leprosy, the implication is that Uziah will never even go to the temple, let alone to attempt to offer any kind of sacrifice. Maybe one of the stories that will come quickly to mind that will remind us of someone who was cast out of the community by reason of leprosy is Miriam and Aaron attacking Moses. You remember the story? And Miriam looked at Moses and said, you this small boy, it was me that watched over you when you were to be killed and facilitated how you were handed over to Pharaoh's daughter. And now you want to stand and brag before us that God talks to you. He talks to me too. Who are you? I carried you on my back. Someone has told me this before. Miriam said that to Moses. And when God descended in his anger, and Moses was apologizing on behalf of Miriam and the brother. God said, Moses, get out of my way. Get out of my way. And before you could snap your finger, Miriam became leprous because of an attempt she made to usurp someone's position that God has installed. Now, the point is this, that even in the community of believers today, as much as we talk about the priesthood of all believers, there are different roles that God has assigned to us in the body of Christ so that the body will function well. We all cannot put ourselves together and perform one function. Take for example, there's going to be a wedding and all of us are coming to join the wedding. So there is an assignment of roles and each role is very key to the life of the community each role is very important to love the community because if one role is not played, the community will not function well. God has given roles and it's important we identify that and work with the roles and the task that God has given to each person. Uziah was king, but because he had overstepped his bound, there were consequences. He remained leprous to his death. He never received any healing. And that is why, by reason of being king and then leprous, he could not take charge of things and perform public functions. So his son, Jotam, became a co-regent, who will be the face of the throne before the community. Nonetheless, his period is still reckoned with as one of the finest of times in the nation of Judah. He was so strong that some of their cities and villages that were captured by the enemies, Uzziah returned them back under the leadership of the kingdom of Judah. So, it was very significant that the prophet at this material time was witnessing the vision of God about the time that King Uzziah died, because he saw this vision, as the 6 verse 1 tells us, in the year that King Uzziah died. 
With the death of King Uziah, probably the nation was going to witness a situation of hopelessness and despair. Because other kings that followed after Uziah were weaklings. People like Jotham that we talked about, he was a weakling. And the next one that followed after Jotham, his own son, King Ahaz. In fact, his own was worse to the point that he had to go to the Assyrians to form an alliance with them because he was seeking for protection. Remember, his grandfather had won their lands that were captured, but by the time the grandchild came, he was looking for protection from other nations. This is what usually happens when a people will decide to go off the track of the kingship of God, there will be a terrible decline. I don't need to say more about our country. You already know the story. When you observe that declining is happening in Nigeria, it is because we have been bearing off ever long time ago. Uh, it's not something that began today. So it was close to this critical point that the prophet Isaiah saw God seated on the throne and for me, the significance of this could be that although King Uziah was going to die, the powerful and the great King Uziah, and the nation was going to despair, where will our hope lie? God is sending a message to Isaiah. And this is it. That the true king of Israel, and indeed of the entire universe, is still on the throne. Amen. Friends, our God is alive. Our God is always on the throne. Our God is our true ruler in Nigeria. So do not despair. Whatever the situation, God is always on the throne. I want to draw a contrast between what Isaiah saw and what Ezekiel saw. When the vision was given to Ezekiel, remember when we studied Ezekiel? Even thinking about the vision that Ezekiel saw, he's sending my ear to stand on their edge. Ezekiel saw the vision of God, but he did not see God the same manner and way that Isaiah saw God. Isaiah saw God seated on the throne in the temple, in the heavenly temple. Now, the implication of that is the king is around and all is well. All is what? All is well. Because the king is on the throne. And he is seated. It means everyone be calm. There is peace. All is at well. But what Ezekiel saw was a terrifying vision of God. God was not in the temple on the throne. But God was in a chariot. And the chariot was moving in all directions. It was a terrifying sight. God was angry and God was on his way to fight a battle. And the worst part of the situation is that God was not going to fight the enemies of his children. He was going to fight his children. You don't want to see that kind of vision. That God is greeted for war and you, his own child, you are the enemy. That is what Ezekiel saw. And that was quite terrifying. But thank God that we can apply what Isaiah saw, I hope, in our time to say that, yeah, God is on the throne. But my friends, if God is on his chariot, ready for battle, then we should pray that it is our enemies that he's going to pursue, not us. But can we say that of our nation today, especially on the state of the church in Nigeria? Keep reflecting on that as we journey through these few verses that we have read. And something I want to also mention is that seeing God was critical to laying the foundation of who the nation should pledge her allegiance to, so that when kings will come after to understand what Isaiah saw, instead of Ahaz going to Assyrians, he should know that God is on the throne and our trust should be upon him. But Uziah failed in that direction. And I think I will say the same of us believers in our country today. I do not know what side is besieging us. I do not know what is terrifying us. I can't say the extent of it all. But one thing I know is that the Lord is seated on the throne. 
He is the all-powerful God, and I do not need any ungodly alliance in order to say to stay safe and protected. God is able to protect me. God is able to keep me safe, irrespective of any human that sits in authority. I have no fear because God sits in authority of that particular individual that may be a terror to me or to any of God's children. Only those who understand the holiness of God can see God on the throne. When you despair, it's because you do not see a clear picture of God seated in his heavenly throne. Isaiah may be deliberately talking about his commissioning at this point, not starting from chapter 1, as other writers will do. David Ezekiel began from chapter 1. Even Jeremiah began his commissioning from chapter 1. But Isaiah had to actually talk about the state of the nation and to come to the point where people will see the reason of the commissioning. So it was not ordered in a chronological order, but that the case was presented and even a picture of hope was painted before we see the commissioning of Isaiah. Gazing into the holiness of God. The holiness of God will do the following three things that I want us to look at today. The first one is that it will reveal the glory of God. Beholding the holiness of God will reveal the glory of God. Now the description given of God sitting on the throne that we have read in this passage will quickly bring to mind the description of the Son of Man that John the Apostle saw in the book of Revelation chapter 4, especially in the first eight verses of Revelation chapter 4. If you read that account, you will see striking similarities. There are some little variations, but a striking similarities. God was reconfirming his message, even to another generation that came hundreds of years after the one that Isaiah spoke with. What Isaiah saw in that vision was a visible manifestation of God. Not that he really saw God in the true sense of God, because we have to understand the context and the implication of that statement. Because God is outside of the imagination or even the order of man's reasoning to be described. God cannot be described in any way. But God can decide to manifest himself before man in ways that we can reason with. God can only show himself in ways that we can relate with. And in the fullness of time, God decided to bring Jesus so that we can see God in a way that we can relate with. I don't think there is anyone greater than that. See Jesus when he was here on earth. Now, accompanying the, 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 the presence and the glory of God in the passage that we have read was what the scripture calls seraphim. Now, seraphims were ministering angels, and those ones were around the throne of God. And the name of these angels, seraphim, means flames of fire, or flame, flaming ones. So they are like fire, flames of fire. That's the meaning of that name. But this is the striking thing about their presence around God's throne. The passage says, they had six wings, with two they cover their faces, with two they cover their feet, and with two they were flying and hovering around the throne, and they were calling one to the other. The amazing thing is how that flaming ministering angels before the glory of God will have to cover their faces because the glory of God was too glorious even for them to behold. I don't think you, you, you really got that. But this is even the caveat for me. The Bible tells me as a child of God, one day I shall go to heaven. And I will watch when I get there. 
I will see God. I will see him as what? I will see him as he is. Because of what? Because I shall be like him. Amen. But angels are not able to behold the glory, the sight, the glorious sight of God. Such glory. And Isaiah saw that. And what he saw them doing at this point was one key thing. They were worshipping the holiness of God. Look at how they were calling out, holy, holy, holy. And you see, the holiness of God is not something to joke with. It portrays his absolute uniqueness. He is unique and different from all that we can perceive. He is absolute. He is complete in his moral purity and in essence. And above all, he is unique in his character. And God, in his holiness, is set apart from all that is profane, all that is common, all that is immoral. He is set apart from all and unique in his own special way. And the holiness of God we share in some small measure. By reason of being God's children, we have been set apart. Just as the children of Israel were set apart by God to minister to the nations around it. We have been set apart to be God's children for a purpose that we minister even to our own generation. And the angels confessed that the Holy God is the Lord Almighty. And another word for that is the Lord of hosts. Talking about the power and the sovereignty of God that controls everything and none and nothing can challenge or contest that position. This is reassuring to the prophet and should be reassuring even to the children of Israel to put their trust and their hope in God because no one and nothing can challenge him. Because his mighty power controls the whole earth, visible and invisible. Remember the New Testament writers? They told us that at the mention of the name Jesus, every knee in heaven and on earth and where? Even beneath the earth. So the point is visible or invisible must bow before the throne of God because Jesus is God. He is all powerful. He is the sovereign God. His mighty power controls the whole earth. And if I have this as my God, what shall I be afraid of? What shall I be worried about? And so they were calling to each other in God's presence. The infinite, the inestimable, the immeasurable, and the unending glory of God. Says the whole earth is full of his glory. You cannot understand the glory of God here on earth if you don't understand God at all. Friends, Isaiah saw a sense of God's displayed presence in a way that he could not describe it. No wonder Paul understood with him very well when he would say, I was taken to the third heaven and I saw things that my mouth is not allowed to speak. The glory of God. Have you ever seen the glory of God in your life? It does not have to be like Isaiah saw his own. But have you seen the glory of God? And that is why Isaiah could confess that he was ruined to find himself in such a place. When you find yourself in the presence of the glory of God, transformation must take place in your life. And we see the power in the worship of God by the angels. How obvious it was that the doors of the heavenly temple shook. If something in heaven will shake, forget it. If that one comes to earth, this earth will not survive it. But look at a small example that God decided to show the children of Israel. When he descended on Mount Sinai and said to Moses, tell the people of Israel, I want to speak to them. And when they saw the manifestation of the presence of God, how the mountain quaked and the whole earth shook, they were terrified. 
And what did they do? They ran away and said, Moses, please, please, tell God, we are okay. You, please, go. Anything he tells you, we will want. We will do. And if this is how he will be appearing to talk with us, we don't, well, we don't want to see him anymore. Please, Moses, just go on our behalf. I think in Nigeria, and even in this generation in this world, honestly, we need God to terrify us more. Are you with me? We need God to terrify us small. Because I look around and I know and I see people no longer fear God. True. People no longer fear God. We have turned him to be our mates, our playmates. I think he should terrify this world one day so that we will be reminded of the majesty and the splendor and the power of this God that we serve. Worship is not about us, but it's about God, who is the center of the worship and the receiver of the worship. When the angels were worshiping, God was at the center of their worship. And so we are able to enjoy powerful worship when God is enthroned in our lives and God is the center of our worship. We must see God in his majesty. We must see God in his splendor in order to worship him correctly. When people don't have a clear vision and the nature and the person of God, they will not worship him correctly. Even those who call him or call themselves his children, they will worship him in one Yamayama worship like that. But when you are able to see God in his majesty and in his splendor, you will be at attention. You will arrange yourself very well so that you worship God correctly. Because the power of God will always accompany true worship. I'm reminded of the story of Paul and Silas when they were put in prison. Instead of groaning, they lifted up one voice in worship of God for whatever predicament they found themselves in. And what happened? The earth shook, friends. His power will always accompany true worship. I just pray that God will give us true worship in Nigeria today. That God will give us true worship in our lives. Beholding the holiness of God. The holiness of God is able to relieve, reveal the sinfulness of man. And that is the second point. The holiness of God reveals the sinfulness of man. Revealing our sinfulness. When Isaiah saw the presence of God, see, he concluded that he was doomed. Because every mortal who saw God with their eyes will die. If I go the Yoruba way, when you see Yoruba man, you like they say, oh, Tibaje, oh, Tibari, oh, Rebio. Are they talking about it? <laughs> if you see a situation where people are just standing and they put their hands like this, even when they are not talking, you know what that means. In other words, they are telling the world, we are finished, we are done with, we are dead. That was exactly the situation with Isaiah when he saw the glory of God. He said, I'm finished. If you look at Genesis, chapter 32, verse 30, Jacob, had an experience and he wrestled with God. Remember that? And his hip was touched and he limped all the way. But what he said in that part, when he named the place Peniel, is that Peniel means the face of God, that he saw God and he was scared. He didn't die. But the, the, the most graphic one that communicates the message is the one we see in Exodus chapter 33, verse 20. You would recall before that time Moses had told God, you call me your friend, right? I want to see you eye to eye. And God said, Moses, I love you. 
You are my good friend. But you know, <laughs> if you see me with this your eyes, you will die. Moses will die. But because of your persuasion, you are my friend. So I will manifest before you. You only see my back, but you can never see my face. At least, not with this mortal body. And he passed in front of Moses. And you remember the chant that was going on when God was passing? Slow in anger, full of mercy and grace, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. You recall that when Moses saw the glimpse of the glory of God on the Mount Sinai, and he came down, the people could not look at God without Moses. Because the glory of God that reflected on his face continued to shine for days. Moses had to veil his face. You can understand why the angels needed to cover their faces. That is why Isaiah confessed that he was a simple man among simple people. He said, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among people. With unclean lips, I am ruined. Woe to me. He did not see himself even better than the people that he represented. Friends, God's grace will come to those who will humble themselves enough to present their true state before God. They are the only ones that will receive mercy. Not like the Pharisee who stood in the temple to pray and said, God, you know I'm not like that man. I give you hard offerings, God, you know that. I pray seven times in a day, I don't know how many times he prays. But he was flaunting his CV. And I see many so-called believers today flaunting their CVs before God as ill to tell him, God, I'm just doing you a favor. I'm serving you with the gifts I have. You should rejoice that you have someone like me in your fold. That is how some people found their CVs before God. But Isaiah, he humbled himself and confessed his sins. And if you take to account what we have been looking at in Isaiah, you will see that this is the single element that God has been asking for from his children. Humility, submission, obedience so they can receive forgiveness. So immediately, Isaiah confessed that he was a man of unclean lips. And I was wondering, why did he say he was a man of unclean lips? He didn't say a man of unclean heart. Or maybe he said he was even an unclean person completely. But I think, as we say, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So whatever you see manifesting in the outside is coming from the inside. But one key thing that is clear is that Isaiah was going to be God's ambassador. He was going to be God's herald. And it was with his lips that he would proclaim God's holiness and God's glory to his own generation. So the direction was beginning to take that tone. How that he was a man of unclean lips and how that it was the instrument that needed to be touched because the task ahead of him was concerned with that. God was interested in having Isaiah proclaim his glory and his holiness, not the glory of any king because he was doing his ministry in the capital and was connected to the palace very greatly. Not to compare or to shine or show forth or proclaim his own glory, not of any king, but of God. But what do we have today? We have many so-called God's own prophets, or whatever they call themselves. If you look at their messages, they are concerned about blowing their own trumpets. They say, if you continue to blow your trumpet, it will get rusty. And that is why many of them are very rusty in themselves. Others take more of their time blowing the trumpets of people in leadership so they can receive favors.
you will recall that before these elections, we had a lot of prophecies. Many claim that they spoke because they heard from God. And they said different things. So we do not know who actually heard from God. Probably none of them did. One key thing that happened in the life of Isaiah that I'm praying for to happen in the life of every child of God is this. That when the holiness of God appears, it deals with all appearances of sin. So that as we move closer to God, the stains on our garments become visible to God. And to us especially, so that we are able to deal with them. So that we can see our failures, we can see our inabilities, we can see our fallenness. The glory and the holiness of God cleanses the humble. It reveals our sin. The contrite heart will receive grace and mercy from God. But those who will decide to be hard-headed, judgment will be fallen. So it's a twofold thing. As God's holiness approaches, it reveals the sinfulness of man either to repentance or to condemnation. Our submission to him will determine the direction that we will go. When Isaiah came close to the holiness of God, his sinfulness was revealed. And in fact, when he cried out, if you look clearly, he didn't say, oh Lord, forgive me. He did not cry for mercy, but he was just busy confessing his utter state of hopelessness. And it was God that took the initiative to rescue him from destruction. God will rescue someone from destruction today. Amen. If you know that God is shining forth his light around your life, his holiness is revealing itself around you, check. Check your garment and respond appropriately. God was preparing Isaiah in such a way that the nation will ultimately respond in the same way that Isaiah responded. To seek out your God mercies in repentance, in submission, and in obedience. And I tell you that as individuals, if we go in that direction, that will be our experience. And that will also be the experience of our nation. If we humbly turn to God and confess our utter hopelessness, God is able to turn our situation around. Isaiah was not able to minister until God touched him. If you look at the passage, you will see what happened as we look at it shortly. But the idea here is talking about how that when God deals with the sinfulness of man, then man is able to minister to God effectively or to minister for God effectively. For man to minister effectively, man must witness the character and the nature of the one true God. One can never be an ambassador or a divine counsel if there is no divine encounter. Man must recognize and accept man's limitations and hopelessness. Because if man is not pardoned at the appearing of the holiness of God, destruction will occur. One story that will remind me or paint this picture clearly is the story of Esther and King Xerxes. You would remember in chapter 4 and 5 of that book of Esther, we were told, and by the tradition of the people, no one dares appear before the king seated in his council. The penalty is death, whoever you are. But because of the pressure that the Jews were facing, Mordecai sent a message to Esther and said, you have to do something or we are doomed. And if you will want to follow the principle and the policy of the nation, then we are finished. But know that you will not be spared as well. So they prayed and they fasted. But the policy says that when you appear before the king, it's either you die or mercy is extended. And one of the ways that mercy is extended is when the king sends his staff 
before you. And you come, you approach, and you touch the tip of that staff. Then you shall leave. And when Esther prayed and fasted with the community, and she appeared before God, and said, help me as I go into this mission. And she walked graciously into the council of King Xerxes. It was either life or death. And to God's glory, the king extended his staff. And Esther came and touched it. Friends, in our own situation, the Lord is not waiting for us to come in first. His staff has been extended. All we need to do is to stretch for our hands and touch. Are you ready to stretch for your hand today and touch the staff of God? Are you ready to do it? Beholding the holiness of God. And the last point will tell us how that the holiness of God reveals his redemption. And the redemption of the Lord is presented here in twofold in the passage that we have read. The first thing we see in the act of redemption is that the guilt is taken away. The sin is atoned for and the guilt is taken away. If you look at verse 6 of our passage, you will see what the prophet said. He said, The marvelous seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongues from the altar. Verse 7. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Now, one thing that I'm still wondering in my mind, and I will leave it with you, I have no answer for it, but I want you to continue to wonder about it as you go home. This is it. Why? Did the seraphim use a tongue to take the coal from the altar and touch the lips of the prophet? If the coal of fire could touch the lip of the prophet, then the seraphim could as well carry it with his own hands. But he carried it with a tongue. That got me wondering. So keep wondering along with me. But something I want to mention about the coal of fire in summary. The significance of that is this. Levitical system will give you the breakdown. But there's a sacrifice called the Day of Atonement, where the high priest goes into the Holy of Holies of the Temple only once in every year, so that the sacrifice offered will atone for the sin of the entire nation for that year. Next year, he will have to do the same thing to atone for the sin of the entire nation. Now, when such sacrifices were offered, burning coals of fire will play a significant role as they were there in the altar, in the holy place. And so the high priest will fetch them into the holy of holies to burn incense in the presence of the Ark of Covenant as he sprinkles the blood of the sacrificed animal on the mercy seat on top of the Ark of Covenant. And the incense will produce a smoke so that the priest is not taken away to want to gaze into the mercy seat of the Holy of Holies on top of the Ark of Covenant. So it will give a covering, and even a covering to the priest. Now, the coal of fire was taken from the altar to purify the mouth of the prophet. And this is an act that shows the world God's grace as the one who takes away the guilt of the sinner, not any animal, not any individual. And that is what we find in the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that Jesus has atoned for our sins once and for all. Instead of us observing the day of atonement every year, Jesus did it once and for all. And all we need to do is to appeal to that salvific work of Jesus Christ and our sins are forgiven because Jesus paid it all. He paid it all for me. When I hear people say they got something for free, I tell them nothing is free. Whatever you have received for free, someone paid for it. 
someone paid for it. So the freedom that you think you have as a believer in Christ Jesus, he paid for it with his blood, the ultimate sacrifice. An expectation is there waiting. And we will look at how that is affecting the prophet. God's grace will enable one to do the assignment that God has set for him. God had an assignment for Isaiah. But first he had to take away the sins of Isaiah in order to enable Isaiah for the mission he had for him for the nation so that the nation also will leave her sin and be enabled to accomplish their own mission into the entire world. Friends, we are enabled today by God to serve our generation. Amen. So the position that God has given to us is not for us to just sit down, but is to serve and bring transformation to our world. Maybe you would sit and say to yourself, I am not perfect. What do I have? Who am I? Look at the condition of Isaiah. And that will encourage you. Remember, his situation was hopeless. Hopeless. So it is not perfect people that God is looking for, but people who are humble enough, like Isaiah, to accept their limitation so that they can be taken up by God, so that God can make them able. And a good example is Paul. When he encountered God, he realized that whatever I thought I knew, I know nothing. In fact, Paul could make the confession where he says, the good I want to do, I see myself not doing it. Instead, it is evil that is around me all the time. If not for the grace of God. It's the same way we are purified today by the blood of the Lamb and the fire of the Holy Spirit. So that we will be the instrument that God wants to do. So it doesn't matter what you think of yourself. There is nothing that God cannot take and make use of. All he's asking is for us to be available. Isaiah sins were atoned for, his guilt taken away, and by the thing of that, he was not part of the divine council. In verse 8, remember, when God asked, who will go for us? And Isaiah quickly responded, here am I, send me. So it may look like Isaiah volunteered, but remember, he was prepared for this very answer. So he was commissioned before he was dispatched. But God was saying, Isaiah, are you ready for the commission now? Isaiah has now stood before God and said, yes, I am ready. <laughs> Friends, are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? God is looking for who will take his message to our sick and dying world. Will you be available? I hear lots of messages and I'm tempted to ask, who is doing that sending? Because the messages are contradicting themselves. And they are all claiming to come. I mean, so I'm not surprised. If you read the story of uh, Ezekiel and also Jeremiah, and even Isaiah's time, you will see that there were many false prophets. But especially during Ezekiel, they said to the people, don't worry, this exile will finish quick. It's like, don't unpack your bags. We're going back home. And Ezekiel said, hey, don't deceive yourselves. Go and open farms and farm. Give your children to marriage. Plant trees. You'll be here for a long time. There are false prophets among us. In fact, someone said this. That sometimes some people go out there and say, God told me to say A, B, and C. Whereas God is standing there. And that was the first time he was hearing it himself. <laughs> and they will claim, that it was God that sent them. Who sent you? Who is sending you? Now, the second fold that is revealing the redemption of God is preserving of the faithful remnant and is captured in verse 9 to 13. And from the first instance when you read it, it doesn't seem to appear like redemption, especially in verse 9 and verse 10 of our passage. He said, go and tell these people, be ever hearing but never understanding, be ever seeing but never perceiving. 
Make the heart of these people callous. Make their ears dull. Otherwise they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears. And then in verse 11, until the cities lie in ruin and without inhabitants, until the houses are left deserted and the fields ruined and ravaged. Now, you read things like this. Probably Isaiah was expecting that God has cleansed me. He will send me with the same kind of message to cleanse my people. Correct? But God didn't do it that way. Instead, the messages as they were drumming into Isaiah's ears, they were very heavy and terrible messages. No wonder. Isaiah was just waiting for God to finish and then the question came, for how long, O oh Lord, will this be? He was concerned about hearing the end punchline. But this is the summary of the idea here. Because if you look as if God was deliberately sending them away. No. The point is this. That God will push them further to the end so that he will actualize his judgment upon them. And so the message of Isaiah will receive a hardened heart and it will have a hardening effect on the people as well. So that the judgment of God is hastened and then the redemption will also come quickly. So in the first value, it looked like a hopeless situation. But then in the end, the idea is that God is going to send them through this judgment in order that redemption will come. But how is this going to look like? See, you need to understand the situation of the people. They were in a very sinful state. It was so monumental to the point that they were beyond repentance. You know, it's like they say, when the hunter's dog goes too far away, it will not hear the whistling of the master. You understand that? So this is the idea. A mark of rebellion is evident in the lives of the people. They have gone so far from the Lord, they were not going to hear anything anybody is going to tell them. And so for a lasting healing to take place, they must receive a thorough cleansing. There is a kind of thing that happens when either your vehicle or your house is so dirty and you want to fix it, that you will take everything out in order to clean it well and clean the items and then bring everything back together again. So God was not just going to mop the top and clean the dust. He was going to take out everything out. When you see the, the desolation of the land, the ravaging of the land, God will remove them, take them to exile, so that their minds will be cleansed, so that the land itself will be cleansed before God is going to bring them back. Because you see, when a heart is hardened, it must be broken first before it can be softened. So the weight of the prophecy now lies on the shoulder of the prophet. And it seems it will not come soon. But the answer came to Isaiah swiftly. Until the city is destroyed, purged of all evil, and any sign of idol and immorality. In fact, verse 12 says how that the people must be removed. But in verse 13, you will see that there is a promise captured that a tent will be left behind and God referred to them as the remnants or the holy seed, the faithful remnants. They will suffer as well. A few of them from exile will come back after they have been purged. They will suffer. But God is a faithful God. He keeps his covenant and he will never turn his back on his people. And by reason of this, he will keep for himself a faithful remnant, a holy seed that he will sustain in the land. And that holy seed will regrow. That is what you find in verse 13 when he says, and though the tent remains in the land, it will again be laid waste, but as the terrapins and up leaves stumps, when they are cut down, so the holy seed will be the stump in the land. So it will grow back again. The nation will grow back again. Because there is a function that God has set for the nation. 
And that is the function that we have today as believers in Nigeria. To reach out to our world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because it is the only thing that can change our situation. Where men and women are being won for Christ. So the picture may look very gloomy. You may look at the picture of Nigeria and feel very hopeless. Nothing is going to change. Nothing is working. But don't worry. There is beauty after the ashes. Nigeria may be passing through a period of ashes, but the Lord will make her beautiful. The story of the children of Israel is there as a testimony that even after they were taken to exile for many years, hundreds of years, they still came back. They still came back, and the Lord will establish that. I want to conclude with just these few talks. Looking at the passage, you would see clearly that the nature of the appearing of God was to set the tone for the prophet, what God expects of his people, holiness. He's a holy God, and he wants his own people to be holy. He says, I am holy, be holy, for I, the Lord your God, I am holy. The power, the glory, and the majesty, and the splendor of God are to remind his people that God remains the ever-powerful king and he is the ruler over every creation and he will protect and preserve his children just as he did for the children of Israel. In the sinfulness of man, man will have no right to claim the love of God. But Romans will remind us, chapter 5 verse 8, how that God demonstrated his love for us through in this case that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ didn't die for a righteous bunch of people, but for a bunch of sinners. People deep in their sins. We are also reminded that stubborn people who will refuse to hearken to the call of God and it is at their doorpost every day and all the time, if they don't listen, God is going to come in judgment to break them. And you know that process is very painful. God is giving you time, friends. He's giving us time that in our stubbornness, we need to come to that place of understanding the grace of God and His mercy is available so that we can submit in humility and in obedience. When we humble ourselves, God will pick us up. But when we sit on our throne of pride and refuse to hearken to the call of God, destruction awaits us. And that is why I said sometimes it's good for God to terrify us small so that he will bring us back to our senses. But believe me, if we don't obey God, calamity will come. I pray this does not happen to us. The anger of God should be understood that when he comes, it is to cleanse. His anger is not like ours for revenge, it's for cleansing. His anger satisfies his justice because God must punish sin. God can never condone sin. But his mercy will still come to give life. And one thing that I will say lastly that is very principal is this. Taking from the prophet, the power that cleansed Isaiah did not come from him. It came from God. I want us to remember this that we cannot solve our problems. We cannot make ourselves able. We cannot fix our condition. God must come to our rescue and we must accept his act of mercy so that we can be positioned where he wants us to be. It's so that we are also encouraged that as we submit ourselves to God, there is a glimmer of light at the end of the tunnel. We are the hope of our generation. And as long as we are on this earth, this earth will continue to enjoy the mercies of God because we are here. So my prayer is that God will help us to make ourselves available when His holiness shines before us. We embrace God in repentance, in submission, to adore and worship his majesty and his glory so that we will be equipped 
to bring transformation to the world that we live in today. I pray that the Lord will help us to accomplish this. The Lord bless you all.